Dr. Steigman from the Steigman Institute in Heidelberg, Germany. Today, the demand in implant dentistry has increased tremendously. One of the key points is to achieve optimum aesthetics, soft tissue management, and to create the bed for implants. My focus today is in the preparation on the sites for implants, like socket preservation or GBR. The first part, we'll talk about socket preservation, especially in the aesthetic zone, classifications and treatment options which we have. At the Steigman Institute, we are very, very keen to give the patient the optimum which they need. Now, when we look in cases where we need the very good support for our implants, we have choices. We can place an implant immediately, we can place an implant late, or we can prepare the site with socket preservation. Now in socket preservation, we have to differentiate from the site. If we have a patient with a thick biotype, if we have a patient with a thin biotype, if we have an existing buccal plate, no buccal plate, fenestration of the buccal plate, or different dehiscences at different levels. Now when we look at all this, we have a variety also of bone grafting material and soft tissue material. The bone grafting material which we put in the site, the time which we have to wait is very much depending on the qualities of the bone grafting material. If we use autogenous bone for socket preservation, if we use allografts for socket preservation. Now the criteria differ, so let me walk you through all these criteria which we have described. Now when we look, we want to achieve beautiful outcomes. And these beautiful outcomes uh, is necessary a very good planning what we want to do. Now, in the Steigman Institute, we developed different programs of rationality. And that's why it's the place where you know you have to think twice, but it's also called, and people name it, the center of dental rationality. Why the dental rationality? Because you have to be very rational in what you do. We can follow our treatment by algorithms described in the literature, but still we have those borderline cases in the gray zone. Those borderline cases in the gray zone were heuristics and intensified clinical judgment have to take place. In socket preservation, this is very obvious. So, for people with a lot of experience, the decision which material in which indication to use is obvious, but with dentists, with just finished dental schools or our young specialists, they have to know when they should follow algorithms and when it's time to make a stop and to intensify their clinical judgment. So when we look at the different indications which we have, it's very critical to understand that we need more aspects. We have to go from the anatomical side, from the soft tissue side, from a periodontal point of view, but fi final goal, prosthetics has always have to be in our mind, in our planning. Now let me walk you through the beginning of the lectures which we're gonna do. Now what we see here is the difference between a resorbed ridge and a new extracted site. The new extracted site is very different. So when we take a look at this point here, we have a buccal plate which can be fenestrated, can have a dehiscence, can miss totally, and it's very much depending on treatment according to this thickness of the buccal plate. Now when we look at different indication, what we know today in the literature, that if we have an extraction socket with the buccal plate, and this buccal plate is bigger than 1.5 to 2 millimeter, we know from the literature according to spray that maybe this side doesn't absolutely, uh, is important that this side doesn't request bone grafting material or a membrane. Now very important that this side left like this for spontaneous healing can also have good white bone in the end but also good keratinized gingiva and good soft tissue quality. 
However, in the aesthetic zone, these cases are very seldom. In the aesthetic zone, even if the buckle plate is existing, this buckle plate is very thin and we know from the literature that this can be 0.7 millimeters as a medium in the aesthetic zone, especially in the cannons. Now, these have to be treated differently. This site requests doing something, not allowing this ridge to resolve. Now, when we look on the other side where the molar is missing, the premolar is missing, sorry, uh, you can see that doing nothing means that the vestibular plate is going to shrink, your uh, ridge is going to be narrow, and this site will require guided bone regeneration. So the bone can be placed in the socket in the beginning, as we know, or you test it, the regeneration with membrane and bone grafting material. So what we did, we realized that we have to classify the defects, and according to this classification, we have to approach and adjust or determine different treatments. When we look, how we define it? Like I showed in the drawing, if you look at the ST1 case, this is ST1 case, where the buckle plate is intact and thicker than 1.5 millimeters. This is ST1. The other one is ST2. The buckle bone thickness is less than 1.5. Then it's very much important if this buckle plate is intact, if it has an apical fenestration, if it has a dehiscence, and how big is this dehiscence? If we look at the ST3, okay, the dehiscence can be a third of the existing buckle plate, can be half, a third or two, two thirds, and the buckle plate can miss totally. Now, all these sites which we find after the extraction in the aesthetic zone have to be approached in a different way. The ST1 can be approached in some way, very, very seldom. It's mostly you find a buckle plate thicker than two millimeter in the molar site. If we go to the aesthetic zone, we have to deal with ST2 to ST3 cases. Now, this is very important. Now, when we look over the years in the literature, in the past, we thought that after socket preservation, the site needs or requires primary closure. But we know if we do and we attempt for primary closure, we are moving the mucogingival junction from the buckle more to the palate. And then when we uncover the implant, we have to do an apical position flap or other correction of the soft tissue, especially in the aesthetic zone. So when we look at all these papers, which are quoted here, many of them suggest then in socket augmentation, in extraction sockets, or different socket augmentation procedures, we need to improve our soft tissue management skills. But today we know that we go in less and less surgery, we are doing less and less invasive procedures, and these procedures, when we look at them, are reducing the soft tissue surgeries for the patients. So, reducing the soft tissue surgeries when we do the socket preservation procedure or immediate implant placement is meant to reduce the uncovering soft tissue necessity. We want to maintain the keratinized gingiva. We want to maintain the anatomy of the soft tissue. So when we look at all these papers, like I mentioned before, we thought in the past that primary closure is absolutely necessary. As a matter of fact, we just submitted a paper and showing all this technique and the reviewers were asking why and the reason why we don't do any primary closure after socket preservation today. Now when we proceed, when we look again at these cases, we know today that we have to put something in this socket and primary closure is not absolutely necessary. And we developed procedures and we know how to use materials in these cases so that we are not doing any flap raising or soft tissue management. 
Now, when we look here, all our anatomy or our classification is depending on the amount of the buccal plate. So we look more than two millimeters or less than two millimeters. Do we have a buccal plate or we don't have a buccal plate? And if the buccal plate is damaged, if we have a dehiscence of fenestration, this is guiding our treatment in different ways. But all the time, keep in mind that we try to avoid soft tissue management at the time when we go for socket preservation. So what we see here, that we really defined according to the defect classification, how these sockets will be treated. And when we look at this decision tree, what we find that if the thickness is more than one more 0.5 millimeters to two, no alveolar ridge preservation is necessary. And if we want to maintain the blood clot, we can put a collagen matrix in this side. However, if the bone thickness is less than 1.5 millimeter, we need to take action. We have to put something in the socket and prepare it. So if the buccal bone is intact, we will put some grafting material and a coronal ceiling, which can be a coronal matrix. If we have a fenestration already, a membrane will be necessary. There's a very big difference between the ST2B, that means the buccal plate is existing with a fenestration, and when we, there is a missing buccal plate or one third of the buccal plate is missing. In the classification, in the treatment, these two treatments are very similar. We will have bone grafting material and a V-shaped crosslink membrane, absorbable or not crosslink, but better crosslink. The very important, the membrane will be placed in the socket without raising a flap. The membrane will be placed in the socket in a V-shape. The bone grafting material will be placed in the socket. And then this membrane will be sutured to the palatal soft tissue, like described in the literature by Elian and Tarno in the ice cream cone technique. When we go at ST3B, and we have more than one third of the buccal plate missing, up to two thirds, we are using now a non-resorbable PTFE membrane. And again, because we have the access to place this membrane, we will raise or we will tunnel without a flap elevation. We will tunnel between the soft tissue and the existing buccal plate with the dehiscence. The same way we do palatal we will tunnel a little bit and try, after we place the bone grafting material in the socket, to put this non-resorbable membrane inside with a tunneling technique. When the whole buccal plate is missing and we want to use PTFE membrane, again, without having a, uh, looking for primary closure, then we will have the only time when we, we are doing a flap elevation slightly at the palatal slide and more at the buccal side to be able to fix the membrane if necessary and to position it in the ideal position. So in this way, we absolutely, according to the classification we are using in our institute, we are also guiding our treatment. Now when we look at all this, it's very important to understand which situation we have. The buccal plate can be measured with calipers. And sometimes we can, just by visual identification, we can say the therapy. Now, according to these situations, when already we have a buccal plate less than 1.5 millimeters, these are very, very easy procedures. So what we can see, we are putting some bone grafting material into the socket. Probably the existing buccal bone, according to the literature, will resorb. And this grafting material will preserve future volume loss. And then with the collagen matrix, we can avoid any losing of the grafting material. And then with the crisscross suture, which you can describe here, you can see one, two, three, four, we will maintain everything in position. As you can see from the cartoon, there is no attempt for primary closure anymore in the aesthetic zone. And 
like I mentioned before, we want to maintain this band of keratinized gingiva in this zone. Now, when we have a fenestration or when we miss a third of the buckle plate, we can go for the ice cream cone technique and we can now use a collagen membrane, resorbable, which can be placed in the socket without raising a flap against the buckle plate. Then in the second step, filling the bone grafting material into the socket and avoiding any flap elevation at the palatal slide, we will have a suture which will suture the membrane to the palatal soft tissue and maintain everything in position. This membrane exposed in the oral cavity will resorb. Some membranes which are native resorb fast, some membranes resorb not so fast, but we want to maintain this situation. It's very important that the membrane which we placed in the socket against the buccal wall will also resorb and we will have a very good situation maintaining the volume for a, a future implant placement. The membrane is cut in a V-shape, can be cross-linked, resorbable or absorbable, and this is the situation which we use or the treatment which we use for a fenestration of the buccal plate or when we are missing a third of uh, the buccal plate like the dehiscence. Now in these situations where we are missing more of the buccal plate and still we don't want to raise any flap, what we can do is we can do a tunneling approach with tunneling instrument and then stick in this PTFE membrane here, blue in this drawing, between the soft tissue and the buccal plate. But as you can see from the cartoon, the membrane now goes buccally on the uh, buccally of the uh, buccal plate between the soft tissue and the bone versus the resorbable one which will be placed in the socket. And then after covering the extraction socket, placing the membrane slightly, also with the tunneling between the bone and the soft tissue, we can do a crisscross suture and then this membrane should be removed after six to eight weeks. Just before the soft tissue will totally close the extraction socket, this membrane has to be removed. Now when we look in a case like this, and when we take a cr cross section, it's very important to understand if we have a fenestration at this level, which cannot be treated with the PETFE membrane, or if we have missing of this buccal plate. So if we miss this one third, we will use a resorbable membrane. No flap elevation. If we miss two thirds, another one third, we will use a PTFE membrane with a tunneling technique. If we miss one third, the membrane will go inside the socket. If we miss two thirds, totally, this is two thirds the membrane will go outside the socket. Very big difference, inside the socket, outside the socket. And then both membranes will cover. The resorbable one will go under the palatal soft tissue and the non-resorbable one, the, re the non-resorbable one, sorry, will go under the soft tissue and the, the resorbable one will be sutured to the palatal soft tissue. So the resorbable membrane, again, should resist to the environment of the oral cavity as much as possible. When we know there is more of the buccal plate missing and the regeneration of the bone will take more time, we prefer a non-resorbable PTFE membrane. Dense PTFE membrane or not dense PTFE membrane. As we can see here, there is a missing buccal plate. So now, we have to really assess and to find out what's in which section, what's the classification of this case. Is it a ST2 with a fenestration? Or is it the ST3 with a missing buckle plate? And the precision 
of applying this algorithm is very much essentially to the treatment outcome. Now, when we look here, you can see that in the SD2 cases, when we are using the resorbable membrane and a third is missing, we very much avoid any raising of the soft tissue and of the flap. So here we have different clinical views. This is in the posterior zone where we could have two options. One option is that we have a buckle plate more than two millimeter and the socket can be maintained without grafting material. Or even here in patients with thin phenotype or the buckle plate is less than 1.5, we can do an ice cream cone technique. We can use resorbable membrane and you can see the outcome is a very well maintained ridge where implant can be easily placed and we don't allow any loss of value. The most important message from this series of pictures is that we don't attempt again for primary closure, especially in the posterior mandible or in the posterior man, man, uh, maxilla. If we aim for primary closure in the posterior mandible, we are moving the soft tissue towards the lingual. In the maxilla, we are moving the soft tissue towards the palate. This means that the vestibular depth would be shallower, and this will create a lot of uncomfort for the patient and probably future soft tissue surgery. So not aiming from primary closure. So that's why we take very much distance from what was published in the literature in the past. Now, when we are moving more into the aesthetic zone, what we can see here that after the extraction of the first molar, the socket of the anatomy shows the dehiscence of the buccal plate. Here we are placing a resorbable membrane, as mentioned before, inside the socket first, cut in a V-shape. Then we fill the sucker with grafting material. Then we bend the membrane over the extraction socket and we suture it to the palatal soft tissue. In this case, you can add some crisscross sutures. Or if the buccal plate is missing, this is the ST3B, you can see that we have a dehiscence, thin buccal plate in the canine area. We have a dehiscence. This is a ST3 actually. And we are raising a flap. I mean, it's very easy to, uh, because it's easier to fix the membrane over the buckle plate with the dehiscence. This membrane has to be removed after six to eight weeks. You see it's a dense PTFE membrane, which is placed to cover the particulate bone used to graft the socket. And then we can add vertical incisions, usually so we have a better overview of the site. Then we can create very good bone, especially in the aesthetic zone, and we have good stability in this case. Now, when we look at a case like this, the same, we know that any attempt to close such a socket will mean a lot, a lot of disturbance of the soft tissue architecture. Means moving all this soft tissue to the palate. After the extraction, we have to assess the biotype. Is it a thick biotype or a thin biotype? Just by visual inspection, sometimes it's enough in this case. And then we have to assess to see, is there a buckle plate or there is no buckle plate? And if the buckle plate is missing, how much is it missing? Is it one third, two thirds, or the whole buckle plate? Now, when we look here, this is the thick biotype patient with good soft tissue condition. And then when we assess the soft tissue, we see that most of the buck buckle plate is missing. So the decision is very simple. This is a classical ST3 case where we will have to raise a flap. This is the only exception where we raise a flap, but we don't aim for primary closure. We will raise a flap, put the grafting material, put the PTFE membrane, cover the occlusal part of the socket, and then making a crisscross suture on top of that. Now, very critical here is the decision before the therapy and how we classify it. So here you can see we do create a flap elevation, 
with the papilla preservation technique at the base in carotenoid gingiva and then we will place the membrane, fix it very well, apical of the extraction socket, going as much as we can sideways, placing the grafting material which can be a mixture of allograft and xenograft, xenograft alone or allograft. About the material we will talk at a later point when we will see how these materials in, in, uh, influence the therapy and the time for regeneration. And then after three, four months, we can see we could maintain the whole buccal plate. Everything is maintained and now we can place an implant in a very good position. And the mixture of the material we use will not allow any future resorption or reduction of this situation. In this case, we made a screw retained crown after socket preservation and then we can compare. This was the situation before with the natural tooth and that's the situation after with the implant placement. Key is that we gained more keratinized gingiva because we didn't attempt for primary closure. The, sh the vestibulum is not shallower. We could maintain the depth of the vestibulum with this kind of treatment. And here we can, we can compare. This was on the right side, the case with missing buckle plate. On the left side, you can see that the, not only that we maintain the buckle plate, but we created a new way or a new environment. And we try to mix the grafting materials in such a way so that future resorption will not happen. Now, when we go further, you can see this is the, the easiest situation, which can be very well used in the aesthetic zone with a very good aesthetic outcome, putting the grafting material, putting the collagen matrix, and then stabilizing everything with a crisscross suture. The easier it is, the better the predictability. And this missing soft tissue on top of the socket will be covered with new keratinized gingiva because the body has a tendency to regenerate and create this gingiva which we will need. So in these cases where we have intact buccal plate, we just use the collagen matrix. Where we have a fenestration or when we have a missing of the soft tissue or of the buccal plate, a third of the buccal plate is missing, we can use this membrane. So in the past, according to the findings which I mentioned before by Elian and Tarno, with the ice cream cone technique, you could actually buy this membrane which you can put in the socket against the wall and then graft the procedure. What we have in these patients is we have both situations. We have, which I will show you in a minute. So you can see we have both situations. In this tooth here, we can have, we will maintain these two sockets just for beautiful pontic sites. Here, the buckle plate is intact. So less than 1.5 millimeters, no flap elevation, no attempt for primary closure. We just put grafting material into the socket and then with the collagen matrix on top. In this case, we have a missing buckle plate. Missing buckle plate means ST2 immediately now we have to see how much of the buckle plate is missing. One third ice cream cone membrane goes into the socket first. Second, grafting material. Third, suturing the membrane to the palatal soft tissue, as we can see in these cases. So it becomes very predictable. And as I mentioned, following this algorithm gives us predictability. Knowledge and knowing the literature means to treat with predictability, leaving very, very little space for uncertainty. However, as I mentioned at the beginning of my lecture, when we have those borderline cases where intensive clinical judgment is needed, where rationality comes into place, of course, we can have then different treatment options in the gray zone. So when we look in a case like this, the same, we have no attempt we have no attempt for primary closure. We have a dehiscence of three millimeters. The membrane goes into the socket 
inside the socket against the buckle bone. We will put the grafting material inside and then we will suture everything to the palate. So this predictability in the treatment is very important for us. In the aesthetic zone, when we look in a case like this, when we analyze the x-ray, we can see that there's a lot of bone loss in this region. We have good peaks of bone, still, in a case with a diastema, it's a very challenging case. Now, a case like this, if primary stability could be achieved, could be a good candidate for immediate implant placement. However, today we know that the buccal palatal implant positioning is so important for the aesthetics. So if we do a CBCT, we will see that the tooth is in a very buccal position. And placing the implant in the same position will not have a good aesthetic outcome. However, placing the implant more palatal will have an angulation which is detrimental to the occlusion. So a case like this, if the implant can be placed in ideal position, can be a good candidate for immediate implant. However, if the implant is in a not ideal position, then we look for socket preservation. And then we will extract the tooth, and again, after tooth extraction, we will start with the analysis and with the classification of the sockets to describe which will be the ideal therapy. Now, when we look at the ideal implant positioning, it's very important to understand in today's implantology how we are looking at this position. So if this is the plane of occlusion, and this will be the extraction socket, and the implant, the tooth, sorry, the tooth will be in this position. After extraction, we have a tendency to place the implant more palatal to achieve primer stability, which is a good treatment option. So the implant will go in this position. Okay. So as you can see, there is a discrepancy between the future implant position and the tooth position. However, there are multiple treatment options. One for a cement retained crown. This could be the future abutment. Let me take another color. This will be the future abutment. Okay. Or for a screw retained, the implant position, even if we can screw in an angled position, the implant position should be slightly different. And if we are aiming for this implant position, we will have to do socket preservation and sometimes even a small grafting procedure. So this is for me the key determinant factor if I place the implant immediately or if I do socket preservation, place the implant later and then even add some guided bone regeneration in this case. So after analysis of this case, when we look, we decided that the ideal position of the implant would be compromised in an immediate implant placement case. So after extraction, we will clean the socket, debridement with curettes, even use some bursts to refresh the bleeding or make sure that there is no granulation tissue remaining. We will put the membrane into the socket and then fill the socket with bone grafting material. If only one third or only a little bit of the buccal plate is missing with the dehiscency, we can sometimes even place the membrane and tuck it in later. And then as described in the cartoons before, with the crisscross suture, will we maintain anything? So after this procedure of socket preservation, we will expect a very good bone healing. This soft tissue will close. We will have a lot of keratinized gingiva. And what we see in the movie is how it looks four to six months after socket preservation. Now the surgery will be placed to make an implant. After anesthesia of the patients, we will perform the axis, the first axis before flap elevation with the help of a soft tissue punch. The soft tissue which will harvest 
from the soft tissue punch we will use later on as uh, quote unquote connective tissue graft to thicken the buccal soft tissue. And after that, in this case, you can see that ideal position of the implant is my priority. This is before we are raising the flap. And if we have an ideal position of the implant, we can do it flapless. But if we think that we will not have enough buccal plate or that the apex of the implant will perforate, like I showed in this drawing, will perforate buccally, and we will have to add some grafting procedure, some GBR, we will do now a flap elevation. The flap elevation will be done with papilla preservation procedure or with the papilla base incision. This will be a split flap at the base of the papilla, and this split flap of the base of the papilla will anchor the connective tissue in the bone, and then the flap repositioning can be done more easily than if we have sharp papilla cut. Then we will raise the corners of the flap, and then we will raise the flap easily. If we see that we need more access for the additional GBR, we will do a hockey stick incision on the neighboring tooth and trying in this case with the help of a triangular flap design to have good access. Essentially, what's now important for our lecture to assess or to reassess the quality of the bone we gained with the socket preservation procedure, ST3. So, ST2, sorry. ST2 means we use allograft in combination with xenograft, but we place the implant into the socket where we have one third of the missing buccal bone. So, the hissens of one third. So, here we can assess, now you can see how this new bone behaves when we are proceeding with our osteotomy and placing the implant in the site. This allows us now to place the implant in the ideal position with a very good aesthetical outcome. Allows us also ideal implant positioning for screw retained or cement retained crown and gives us the possibility to add some GBR at the apex of the tooth like seen in the movie. And when we look here, this procedure is only necessary when we have enough stability of the implant. And then what we took here with the soft tissue punch, we will use as a connective tissue improvement of the soft tissue so the crown will have a very natural look. Then this flap will be closed with double sling sutures with 5.0 suturing material and everything will be back in position. These sutures will be removed early but you can see we have a very good follow-up and then we can see again in pictures the result of our socket preservation. You can see that we have a very good volume maintenance and if we assess the CBCT it's very important in the CBCT to see the volume in a cross section. So what we can see, the tooth was in, the buccal plate was very thin and after extraction here, a fenestration could have been. We miss one third, so ST2 procedure can be performed. After socket preservation, this was, CBCT was taken about four months after, you can see the good volume, and now the implant can be placed in the ideal position. In a mesiodistal aspect around the implant, we can also see how filling the socket will level the bone to the level of the interproximal peaks of bone, and we are moving in a very good manner. So the peaks of bone gives us the guideline where my socket preservation procedure where the bone, at which level the bone will grow. And then, after the osseointegration of the implant, we wait for another four to six months, depending on the implant system. You can see 
with this screwdriver placed in when we remove the cover screw that the implant is in the ideal position. The shank of the screwdriver is slightly palatal from the incisal edge of the neighboring teeth. That means my socket preservation procedure laid the foundation for a very good aesthetics. And this is where we are aiming today. And then we can see that in this way, my result, my aesthetics became very, very predictable and we are very happy with the result. In this case, the abutment design also plays a major role. In this way, we can control the gingival margin of the crown. The soft tissue is supported by the abutment, by the gingival margin is created by the crown. And as a consequence of the socket preservation procedure, as a consequence of the classification we proposed to know what to do in this case, we can end up with a very, very good result. Please appreciate the lack of scars which we have in this case and the gingival margin outcome is, which is also depending on the implant positioning. So you can see with the help of recreation and design which we have in the dental lab, which we create this soft tissue outcome and we can see that the ideal position of the soft tissue is depending on the foundation which is laid with the help of the socket preservation procedures. Today we know more than before that implant positioning is so key and to be able to do that some authors even describe not only socket preservation but also socket transformation. It means that the bone grafting procedure have to be sometimes even more buckle than the pre-existing pre socket. So when we look here, in a case like this, let me give you an example how we use now the material. In a case like this, the material we use tells us how long we have to wait before we replace an implant. If we are using autogenous bone alone, this will have not, cannot maintain the volume. So for volume maintenance, we need some material with slow or non-resorption. And this is enough to have 20% of this material. So when we look in a case like this, for volume maintenance, I'm going for 20% xenograft. And then, because I want to achieve good osseointegration, the rest of the 80% can be autogenous bone or the 80% can be allograft. Now I know in some countries the allograft is not permitted, so autogenous bone is the alternative. The 80% will allow good osseointegration and the 20% will give us good stability. So if we have this combination, after four months, after socket preservation, we can place an implant in. So according to the time and according to my goal, I know which material from a bone grafting to choose. So in the first part of the lecture, we were talking about the classification of the sockets, intact buckle bone, more than two millimeters, thin buckle bone and intact, fenestration of the buckle bone and missing of the buckle bone from one third, two thirds to total missing of the buckle bone. And then we went to talk about which membrane according to which procedure. No membrane in ST1. Collagen matrix when the buccal plate is intact. The material is chosen according to volume stability and the time we want till we place our implants. So if you want four months, then we can go for a material which is different, as you can see in the CBCTs. So we use an allograft if we want four months. We use a xenograft when we go for six to nine months. And if we have this combination of 80-20, we can choose the same time before implant placement like we use for allograft alone. So please keep in mind that this is a very important part of the global therapy of the socket preservation. But there is a very big difference when we talk about socket preservation versus guided bone regeneration. 
In socket preservation, the purpose is to maintain the volume. In GBR, the purpose is to increase the volume of a resorbed ridge. So we have different purposes. The goal in both of them is to place an implant. The situation today is that we can use these techniques predictable. predictable. We know which material to use, which know how to classify the defects for socket preservation and GBR. There are big benefits. The benefit is that we can use with minimally invasive techniques and therapies, we can give the patient a good treatment with good function and good aesthetics. The next step will be to make these techniques even easier. And by following these classifications which we have in the literature today, the doctor can choose the treatment of choice, the best treatment for every patient according to diagnostic ink in place. And we will have, in conclusion, we will have new materials which we can use for these procedures. And today we know what to look for. Today we know that we don't aim for primer stability. Now staying with the material, it's very important to understand that in some cases we are looking for primary closure when we have native collagen and a flap. But in most of the cases today, when we don't aim for primary closure, we can use non-resorbable membrane or cross link membrane. And then we can leave the membrane exposed to the oral cavity. On the other hand, the material we are using is depending on the time, depending on the volume stability, but today we don't have to use one or the other. We can use a combination of both of them. Now, when we are looking in GBR, versus socket preservation, primary closure is always absolutely necessary. Let me point out this again, because this many times is a confusion. In GBR, we always aim for primary closure, no matter which material we are using. Versus socket, where we don't aim for primary closure every time we are performing socket preservation, because the aim is maintaining versus creation of the bone. Another very important is the timing. If we are going for staged procedures, that means we create the bone first, socket preservation, we create the bone first with guided bone uh, regeneration after resorption, okay, we can mix the material. However, if we go for immediate implant placement, and we are doing the grafting procedure on the socket preservation simultaneously, then we have to look at layers. Layers mean that first layer on the implant should always be autogenous bone, even if we put the implant in the socket. Usually we do socket preservation and then we place the implant. If you aim for immediate implant placement, then the layer on the implant should be autogenous bone. The second layer should be an allograft. And the third layer should be a xenograft. And then you can see if we are looking for primary closure or not. Usually in sockets, not in GBR, we do. If we are going much outside the envelope of bone, like I mentioned, in a missing buckle plate, and you are looking for over-contouring for socket transformation, then you can go up to 50% xenograft. This has not been proven yet, this combination of materials. This is what we are looking for, our clinical experience, and the more research has to be performed to find out which is the ideal combination. However, in our long clinical experience, we found out 2080 is a very good uh, combination of materials. However, when we go much outside on, of the envelope of bone, and we want to have longevity of the graft, and avoid resorption, we can go up to 50-50. Now, let's conclude a little bit of what we talked about socket preservation. It's very important to understand the material, the membrane, and the most important thing is to classify the defect to know what to use. So you can see that also from a clinical standpoint is very important. Should we aim for primary closure? Should we not aim for primary closure? So this combination and the layers, as I mentioned before, are very, very important to understand 
why in some cases we are using or placing an implant immediately and why in other cases we try to avoid it because it's much more difficult to make this layer in an immediate implant in the socket than to just put one of these grafting materials around the implant. The key for this procedure is the diagnostics. And as we see from this decision tree, according to the diagnostic of the socket, we know which procedure, we know which membrane to use, we know what material or which combination. And if we follow these algorithms of decision we were talking about and trying to focus on a step-by-step -step development of the site for future implant placement, especially in the aesthetic zone, we can achieve a very predictable and good results. And if we look What's the socket preservation as a consequence? We want to preserve the bone resorption. We want to use the same amount of bone like a natural tooth or sometimes even more. The purpose, the goal is function. It used to be in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Today, aesthetics and soft tissues uh, architecture is very important. Then. Today, until today, there was no general protocol. Today, I gave you a protocol for almost every indication which we find after extraction of a tooth. From the soft tissue, biotype thickness, from the buccal plate existence and thickness, to fenestration cases or dehiscence cases. It's a simple procedure. Everybody can perform it. That's one of the biggest benefits. You don't have to have vast clinical experience to be able to perform socket preservation procedure. Today, we are developing more and more predictable procedures and easy to use. And today, I defined for you techniques and material. And the adequate education which you have to go through to be able to make your life easier to be simple and have a socket preservation procedure. This was a whole range of possibilities which we have in socket preservation, which became more and more part of our daily routine. We have to follow algorithms, decision trees, and concept in the literature, but also based on our vast clinical experience. Bye-bye from the Steigman Institute in Heidelberg, Germany. I hope this will help you improve your daily practice and have a better outcome for your patients.